Hi, Scott. Hey, Pete. Hey, you ready to learn about some digital data acquisition today? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's got an exciting uh, subtitle here, something that I don't know if I've ever done in my life, how to make a good measurement. How do you feel about your ability to make good measurements? I'll tell you, if I'm honest, it's like washing the dishes. You break enough dishes and you get out of doing, being made to do the dishes. So I kind of took this tack with measurements. So I don't know that I've never, ever made a good measurement myself either, but I'd like to learn how if you know I yeah. should ever need to. That sounds good. <laughs> An interesting tack you took for your life there and, and for dishwashing. Um, yeah, so the digital data acquisition has a lot to do with uh, signals and processing of them, getting the signals good. This first part we're gonna talk about trying to measure very well a signal from a transducer that tells us what our product's doing. So we're gonna be talking about transducers like accelerometers that measure vibration, microphones, uh, strain gauges, thermocouples, things like that, that uh, output some sort of analog voltage over time that we're going to capture. To, to get a good measurement, there's a lot of things I guess we could use as criteria. It shouldn't have a lot of noise in the measurement that are not due to the actual measurement the, itself or the actual product that we're measuring. Uh, computers can only measure data discreetly in discrete chunks, so you have to convert from analog to digital, so there's some things you might have to worry about there. And and these transducers need to be conditioned properly, have good wiring and things like that. We'll talk about some of these things. So uh, we're about to go through the measurement chain, starting with the structure, ending up with a digital file. Here's what the measurement chain looks like as a, a diagram. Again, starting with the structure, you got your sensors, some signal conditioning, aliasing, analog to digital conversion, some DSP stuff, which will be covering in the second part here. Um, and all along the way, there's all sorts of things we might need to look out for, like noise on our cables, conditioning issues, filtering, calculation errors. So, so we're about to go on a journey through the measurement chain, Scott, and we got all these obstacles in the way. Does this remind you of anything? Um, five will goes west. Oh. What? Who goes west? <laughs> five will. Fievel. I don't know Fievel. So, was it was that a movie? Yeah. Well, it's a song from yeah. It's a, it's a sequel to an American Tale, somewhere out there. Oh. I, I, I said I wouldn't sing. Anyway, you're, look, sounds like you're going to talk about something a little bit older, Jules Verne. Yeah, I guess I am a little bit older. So yeah, Jules Verne. There was a book, and then. Uh, uh, movie journey to the center of the earth where they had to go through a bunch of obstacles that's kind of like them going through the measurement chain i think they discovered dinosaurs i don't think we'll discover dinosaurs in the center of the earth probably not <clears throat> and then uh fantastic voyage i think that was a book and a movie in the 70s where they went into the human body they're miniaturized oh sure yeah a classic you know and you had to fight red blood cells or white blood cells you know yeah, the story bots did the same thing. The white blood cells come and attack them, but then they become friends with the story bots. And anyway, a little yeah. update for right. reference. But let's uh, let's begin our journey. Let's start at the structure. So the first part here, we're going to be measuring some sort of product or uh, a structure, and that structure, you know, really, if you think about it, it could be a field measurement where you're underwater, right? or up in the air. Uh, you could be in a nice lab measuring something. You could be in a dump. Here's a SCADIS that's measuring this uh, construction equipment. So, you know, depending on the conditions that the structure is in, uh, that could have a lot of considerations like uh, how, you're, how you're gonna measure it and what you're gonna do. You know, here I need waterproof equipment. Here I might need stuff that's good for moisture condensation if it gets high enough to the atmosphere, I guess. Yeah. So the structure and the, the conditions it's operating under can really influence things. So I guess in general, you know, if we think about something like this structure, it's in a lab, it's not operating, it should be a little bit easier than if we were out in the field 
and we were doing, and it was operating and running, right? Generate sure. electric fields and things like that. And I had to traipse the equipment out there. So easier to, to harder there. If I think about something like this wind turbine and the operating conditions, well, there's a few ways to think about that operating condition. One is if that it's the operating condition of interest. We got to take extra care to make sure we're getting good measurements because you're not going to be able to test that again very quick. Nope. And, you know, if we do tests and we don't get the good, the true operating conditions for the equipment, then we're going to test something that's not representative and it could fail in real life. The other thing is, you know, something like this windmill, it's where are you going to measure? You know, there's multiple things. There's like a gearbox here. There's uh, rotor blades. There's a hub. So uh, you have to think about uh, how we're going to uh, do these measurements and where on the structure. You know, these are complex systems. Do we have enough transducers and things like that? It kind of makes sense, Scott. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, the structure operating conditions do we know what the key components are that we need to measure we didn't mention this but the highest frequency of interest you know if we have a product that's making an annoying 4000 hertz tone that people are complaining about if we don't sample fast enough we won't capture it so we need to know like what's that highest frequency of interest that the structure or test object is producing do we need long wires because talk about some of the considerations there. Did it have electric currents? Because that can screw up uh, the measurements. I think we'll spend a fair amount of time in the presentation on this, but if I have electrical fields going on, what what might show up in my data? Hmm. Some electrical noise. I'm assuming it's going to have yeah. noise in my data. Could be at 60 hertz or 50 hertz, depending if I'm in Europe or not or in the US. And of course, you could have products nowadays, electrification's gaining a, a lot of ground that generate a lot of electric fields. So if you're measuring vibration, if some of it's induced electrically, it might be hard to tell what's the true vibration because maybe your power generator works at 60 Hertz and what's the electrically induced part. So lots of, lots of fun stuff to think mm. about on the structures. In fact, it's so fun, I want to stop thinking about it. Let's go to sensors, shall we, Scott? Sounds good. So a sensor is a, you know, a transducer that you install on the product in order to measure things. So you know, there's a variety of transducers that we're typically interested in, things like strain gauges for measuring strain and thus stress, accelerometers for measuring vibration, microphones, Temperature, displacement, forces could be measured with a wheel force transducer or a torque cell, for example. And so all these things, one of the first things we might think about is how are we going to mount or install that transducer onto the product? Uh, one way here is this thing called a hand probe. What's a hand probe? Oh, this is where you're just sort of holding the accelerometer against the structure, right? Yeah, you got an accelerometer here, and then you hold this thing, and this touches the vibrating surface, and you hope to pick up the vibration. And uh, what happens is the frequency range up to which you can measure is affected by the fact that you're holding it. Your hand can't move back and forth fast enough to keep up with the vibrating surface above a certain frequency. So as a result, you can see that in the, the light, I don't know, what's that color called, Scott? Light aqua? Sure. Seafoam green. Seafoam green. Oh, that's even better. It doesn't go up very far in frequency compared to the other methods. So maybe we want to like easily mount it. So we'll throw a magnet on the base of the accelerometer and throw that against the vibrating surface. How does that, that do? Uh, that does better provided you have a steel structure or something with iron in it that will actually hold the magnet. But yeah, it does better in frequency, but yeah not, not even up to 2000 hertz there it's interesting but a plastic part maybe yeah at a certain point even on a metal structure it kind of uh, doesn't keep up the magnetic field it can be thrown off of the vibrating surface so uh, one of the best ways of mounting these types of transducers is things like stud mounting this is an actual little screw here that does go into the surface of the st structure and uh, um, 
mounts the accelerometer directly to the surface, and there you can get some of your highest frequency ranges. So this is a consideration. There's a lot of other things, like uh, you could use uh, super glue or um, dental cement, things like that. Uh, but yeah, we want it to keep on there, keep a solid attachment, take data up to a high frequency range. That make sense that mounting of the transducers could be pretty important, Scott? Yeah, definitely. And then uh, we said we'd spend a lot of time on electrical stuff. Here is something called a ground loop. And we'll talk about how that's related to the transducers. A ground loop means I'm measuring, uh, I would hope to see maybe the blue curve here where there's no ground loop. But instead, I see some spikes throughout the uh, frequency spectrum. And they might be multiples of 60 or 50 hertz that are electrically induced, not really part of the structure or part of the, the measurement. And so let's, it's a, called a ground loop. Let's talk about what could cause that. So here I have a, my measurement system, a SCADIS. And notice the SCADIS is typically plugged into the wall, so your mains, and uh, it's grounded there. But then we, here we have an accelerometer attached to our test object. It's also going to ground, but it's a different ground than what's on the mains. It's, I guess, what you would call the structure's ground. And they're two different things, and this can create a ground loop. Have you ever seen something like that occur, Scott? Uh, unfortunately, I have, where the uh, two different grounds creates this ground loop, yeah. Yeah. So you might see this uh, as a result, like we've mentioned before, the 60 hertz spike. Probably not a good idea to stake your whole career on like, hey, there's some bad vibration at 60 hertz, right? Because that may not be coming from the vibration of the test object, but might be coming from a nearby power generator, uh, the lights in uh, your lab or something like that, right? Yeah, I'd be very suspicious of any 60 hertz problem. Yeah. Very lightly damped 60 hertz problem. Sure. So if someone's talking about a lightly damped 60 hertz problem, you might want to do some double checking. If you're out in the field and you catch this, there's some things you could uh, maybe do. Um, you want to break one of these paths to ground. So, for example, if you have one of our SimCenter SCADIS units, I can disconnect it from power because it has an internal battery that runs on DC. And when that is broken there's only one path to ground and if the electrical noise goes away i know i have a ground loop if it doesn't go away then there's a chance that that 60 hertz is is real so so quick troubleshooting disconnect this now maybe you got to measure for a kajillion hours and the battery here won't last a kajillion hours so alternatively what we could do is break that path to ground by using isolation pads between our transducer and the test object do you see how that kind of breaks that path Scott. Yep. yep. And then I can power it and keep running. So accelerometers with an isolation pad is a good thing. You can also get some accelerometers that have electrical isolation built in, like PC. Mm -hmm. They have a J suffix. Um, you know, other transducers where you could see things, strain gauges are usually isolated because there's like a, a surface that they're put on. They're not quite directly on the metal surface of the test object. But yeah, in general, you want to isolate your sensors so there's no additional path to ground, no electrical current that can flow between the two. Does that kind of make sense to you, Scott? Yep. Some other little things you could try. You, some of you might be in labs that have an orange power plugs. Those are actually clean power. So sometimes the ground isn't all that great on regular power outlets. So you could try plugging your instrumentation to orange power. Here we have a SCADIS measurement system. And another alternative, you probably look in the box. You may not even know you have this. There is something called a ground strap, which you know you can screw into this SCADIS. It comes with the SCADIS. And then you can attach this side with like a bolt to the structure itself to make the ground the same between the two. And sometimes that can solve the issue. Oh, you don't. You don't plug that ground cable into the orange outlet, though. No, don't don't plug it in here. Just mm -hmm. it to the structure, the test structure itself. Okay, no. okay. I, I got to make a phone call, yeah. real quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
So we've kind of gone through a few considerations with the structure and the sensor. Hopefully your phone call's uh, done there soon. And now we'll talk about uh, the wiring and what, what could potentially go or things we should think about when, uh, with the wiring of our sensors that connect to our data acquisition system. So here's some wires. What do you think about these, Scott? That looks uh, complicated. Yeah. And stressful. <laughs> and uh, heavy. Could yeah. Influence the test structure quite a bit. Um, yeah, so uh, wires, you know, it could be massive, uh, things like that. If you have a lot of wires, it could be, you know, you could have intermittent connections if the thing's shaking a lot. Uh, luckily, on a lot of the SCADIS units, there's a light that will indicate if the ICP power draw isn't quite right, so it'll tell you if you have a bad cable. Um, if they're, if the cables are uh, long, you can imagine the longer the cable, it can act kind of like an antenna and pick up electromagnetic interference. So there's electrostatic interference, you know, that's an accumulated electrical charge, and then there's this electromagnetic interference. Either way, you probably want to keep a good shield around your uh, wires that are running inside your cable. So this shows a braided shield here um, to kind of fend off the electromagnetic uh, charges. So shielded cables are better. Here we have a power wire running next to our signal wire. What's going on there, Scott? Well, the, the power flowing through the power wire, uh, when there's a flow of electricity, it creates this magnetic field that you are showing in the green circles there. And I would assume if the signal wire is running through one of those magnetic fields and it doesn't have a good shield on it, then I could be inducing some electromagnetic interference in my signal wire. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. And again, the longer the wire, the more it acts like an antenna picking this stuff up. So short wires help. Like if you can have your scatus very close to where the transducers are, have short cable runs, less chance of electromagnetic interference, braid the things. Um, and then there's even other things, not just electrical interference. Um, here we have an example of a strain gauge, full bridge, uh, that we're going to take a measurement with, and we have a one meter cable. Here we have a full bridge and we have a hundred meter cable, and we supply a, a voltage, in the case of a full bridge, a positive and a negative voltage to the bridge to power it. And you know, let's say this bridge, bridge requires uh, five volts or something like that. Well, we start the supply back here. So if I apply five volts here, Will it be five volts by the time it gets out over here? Um, probably not. Yeah, there's a chance. The longer the cable, higher the chance it gets lower as it gets out there, right? Shorter cable, less chance. So uh, the voltage, you know, in a you know flowing through something like this is uh, equal to the uh, current times the resistance. The longer the cable, the greater the resistance. Sure. So how do we ensure that uh, we're powering this thing properly? I guess if there's a way you could measure at the gauge what the voltage it, it's receiving is, right? Yeah, that's something called a sense line. We could also just guess. That's what uh, we call lead wire compensation. <laughs> that seems even easier. Yeah. Well, and you have to be careful guessing, but you got to make an educated guess. You can type in in like our data acquisition system what the resistance of the cable is. And if you know the distance of the cable and the resistance per foot, you can put that in and it'll adjust that uh, accordingly. Or we could actually measure the voltage. And it's important to measure that uh, voltage knows the same because, uh, you know, sometimes people are calibrate with a short cable, right? But then if you measure with a long cable, what happens is that signal gets lower, but it's not zero signal. So you get a signal, it's just yeah. not the correct amplitude because it's not being powered with five volts like it was when it was calibrated. Does that kind of make sense, Scott? Yeah, very so misleading. In that, that case, we can also run these sense lines we referred to. These are uh, lo low current but they'll measure the voltage very accurately where it's being applied at the gauge to make sure it's five volts. And 
the scatus will automatically increase the voltage to compensate for the loss in the line so that you get exactly 5 volts here. So you don't have to run around with a 5 volt power supply and put it right at the gauge. You can just increase the voltage running through the wires. But uh, if you look at this sense lines, there's uh, two of these. Signal wires for a full bridge, there's two of these. Supply voltage wires, there's two of these. That's six wires. That's uh, a little bit of uh, effort to put together, wouldn't you say, Scott, compared to a quarter bridge, for example, that's just two wires? Yeah. It's like three times the effort. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think you'll find that in general, the higher the quality of the measurement, probably the more things that you have to go through, you know, time-consuming setup type wiring things like this where we have six wires instead of like the two minimum to, to get some sort of signal. Yeah. Uh, accelerometers aren't immune to this either. You know, the cable again has a uh, resistance or capacitance it builds up that uh, causes uh, higher frequencies to be attenuated or maybe not even carried at all. So they'll be reduced or eliminated, you know, and at a, up to a certain frequency, everything's passing. To determine if you have that as an issue or not, there are things like this nomograph that can tell you what the highest frequency is that you can measure given a certain setup. It has uh, the capacitance of the wire on one, and it has the voltage being measured on this axis and, and takes into account the current supply. So if I look here, 100 feet, 300 picocoulombs per foot, that's 3,000 picofarads. I've said, I said picocoulombs, didn't I, Scott? You sure did. Picofarads. I didn't have an opportunity. Too many times. Just once. Okay. So this, uh, that puts us on this line. You can see the uh, versus frequency here. It's attenuating, right, over uh, as it goes higher in frequency. So it's attenuating as it goes higher in frequency. And here's all this voltage stuff. So if we have a 5-volt signal we want to measure, 2-amp supply, we're at 5 here. And this line intersects this line right here. And if we look down, that's 10 kilohertz. What it's saying is we can safely measure right around 10 kilohertz with this setup. What if I want to measure more, more high in frequency? Higher in frequency? Um, you either need a lower capacitance per foot of cable, so maybe a more expensive cable, or you could lower the, the y-axis, which would be changing either the current or the voltage supply there. Yeah, it's not a supply for the voltage. That's actually what we're measuring, but that's the current supplied to the transducer. Yes. Um, yeah, we could say, well, I don't need five volts coming back through the wire. I only need to measure up to one volt because I use a less sensitive transducer. But is that a good idea? Mm, probably not, depending on the signal. But yeah, typically you don't want to. Less sensitive transducer is going to be more susceptible to noise. Yeah, exactly. So, so if we give up on this five volts, we're susceptible to noise. This is more expensive, right? Yeah. Um, typically low resistance cable. Uh, you can also play with the uh, current. So here, we increase the current to nine milliamps. We recalculate this line and now we're up to 100 kilohertz. So if you can, you know, for the same setup, increase the current supply for the transducer, that also helps go up higher in frequency. Cool. Yeah. By the way, a lot of these tips are on the Siemens community, if you ever have a chance to check it out. We got some links to the articles directly here, but it goes back through in detail. And I think in this one, the long cable links for ICP transducers, there's even a, a calculator that you can use so you don't even have to look at the nomograph, just type in the information. Cool. You ever use that community there, Scott? All, all the time. All right. All the time. Very useful. Um, so, Another thing that we could do is if we know the reduction in amplitude uh, that, that the cable is providing, we can actually create an inverse function versus frequency. So this is versus hertz here. 
it's attenuating as we go up in frequency. That's the inverse of the function. And we could create a filter and uh, increase the amplitudes. Some people do that. Now, you can't do that where the signal is zero, but you can do it in a place where it's attenuating it just to get uh, your amplitudes recovered a bit. So some, some of our users will do that for long signals. All right, another aspect of doing a measurement is something called signal conditioning. What do you think that means? Um, you want a very manageable, silky smooth signal, so you condition it just like you use conditioner for your hair, right? That conditioner mean? for your hair? Yeah. I don't, I don't have any hair. I don't know. Is that like shampoo? It's, yeah, it's a, a second step that you do. I go shampoo, then conditioner. Some people go conditioner, then shampoo. It's sort of a, you know, this one of like those things. Foreign language to me. Yeah. Um, no, I think in uh, measurements, Scott, it means that we're going to manipulate this analog signal we're getting out of the transducer to be ready for the next stage of the measurement chain. And so, for example, we might do things like gain it up so that we can digitize it well. We also have to make sure the sensor supply is giving us a good signal back, so adjustments like that. There's also some other things like uh, amps that are used sometimes. They have single-ended and differential and might filter out some noise. So let's talk a little bit about those. Again, we'll go back to this electrical noise example. Here I got my SCADIS measurement system. Got an accelerometer mm -hmm. on this uh, air air pump, and uh, our blue the blue is a cable for the accelerometer. Any problems you see with this measurement setup, Scott? Yeah, I see an extension cord and a big power brick very very close to my transducer cable. They're actually crossing right over on top, so I, I'm asking for some electromagnetic interference. I think. Yeah, I think, you know, best practice, obviously, is don't do this. Keep those power cords away. But uh, let's talk about how this conditioning, single-ended conditioning versus differential conditioning might help. And this is kind of a combination, actually, of uh, the conditioning in the front end, the transducer itself, and the uh, wiring. So here we have maybe an accelerometer out here. It's measuring some vibration, so we get this vibration sine wave voltage coming through the cable, and that's what the SCADA sees. That's ideal when there's no power supplies around. But when we have an electromagnetic source interfering, we'll get an additional 60 hertz component. Could be kind of small compared to the uh, signal itself coming along the cable. Uh, and we would see this on the SCADA size, side of the equation. And you can see that that's... Uh, We'd have a 60 hertz component, right? The red one, and then the actual signal itself over here. Does that kind of make sense, Scott? Yeah. And that's kind of a bit of a problem, even though this is lower. It still throws off the peak amplitude and stuff. We don't want that if we can help it. But that's maybe a limitation, if you will, of a single-ended uh, transducer and um, measurement setup. There, so there's also this thing called a differential coupling that we can do. And again... Certain transducers, you have to buy them specifically, do have a differential output and the corresponding wire for it. And what the output from the transducer is the vibration signal or whatever it happens to be, uh, and an inverted signal that's the opposite of it. And, there, and there's actually multiple wires in the cable, so you don't see multiple wires out there uh, coming down the line. And uh, they get to the, the scatus. Now... If I was to take the green signal and the inverted signal and uh, add them together, what would happen, Scott? Uh, you'd get zero. Yeah, that's not good. So instead of adding them, let's take the difference, subtract. Difference and subtract are the same thing. Difference just sounds fancier. And we use a differential amplifier. All this thing is doing is subtracting. And if I subtract these two from each other, what happens, Scott? Uh, well, if you like subtract a negative number, it's 
it's like adding it so you'll get double the amplitude of the original signal yeah so this thing is double the amplitude but i know that i can divide by two and where this comes in handy is with this electromagnetic interference on the wire it the electromagnetic interference is coming from that power cord nearby it induces the same 60 hertz in both wires in the cable mm -hmm. Whereas the signal is inverted. And if I subtract the same signal, one from the other, what happens? I'll get zero. Yeah. So the electromagnetic interference goes to zero while the signal remains the same. I don't get this thing. I get this. Pretty good, huh? Great. Of course, now we have double the wires. It's a little more expensive. And again, that's keeping with a bit of this theme. High quality measurement requires thinking about, you know, if you're in a place where you have a lot of electromagnetic interference, you may want to get differential transducers, which have a little more complicated uh, setup, if you will. Does that make sense to you, Scott? Sure does. Yeah. So let's uh, take a quick look at that, how that would uh, work. Here I got two strain gauges and a quarter bridge, by the way, is a single ended. Full bridge is a differential transducer. And you can see that there, as I move the power brick near, there's a difference in their behavior. I'm looking at the time on top, the frequency on the bottom. And if we zoom in maybe at 60 hertz, let's see if there's a bit of a difference here. So as I move the power brick close, you see that uh, we get a huge 60 hertz thing in the quarter bridge and hardly anything in the full bridge. Pretty cool, huh? Really cool. Measuring strain at the same place. Uh, one gives us a measurement without electromagnetic interference. The other does not. Quarter versus full. There's another thing called uh, coupling. You can have AC and DC coupling on your transducers. So uh, AC or DC. What does AC-DC stand for, Scott? Rock and roll, man. Oh, yeah. There's that yeah. end. Yeah. Angus and crew. Um, yeah, this, uh, well, that's not what this ACDC stands for. It no, stands for sorry. the AC uh, is an alternating thing, and DC is like an offset. So if we think about a signal of some sort, a DC signal does not change over time. It has a constant offset. An AC signal fluctuates. And signals that we measure could have both components. They could have an offset, and they could have an alternating component. If I do an FFT, this offset part goes to zero hertz in the frequency domain. So on a spectrum, if you see a large value at zero hertz, that's some sort of offset on the signal. And then the fluctuating part goes to whatever frequency corresponds to that. Okay. And... Uh, so a signal can have an AC and DC component, and the coupling you pick on the data acquisition unit can affect whether you see that AC or DC component. Coupling, by the way, means a physical attachment, like you have a cable with a transducer attached coming in. Um, alternating coupling or AC coupling, do you see a DC offset on this signal? No. No, nope. it actually always removes the DC offset on the signal. The transducer might be picking up DC, an offset, but you won't see it because you're using AC coupling. On the other hand, you could have direct coupling, and it's called DC coupling, yet it actually measures both AC and DC components of the signal. So if I have DC coupling on, I would see an offset on my signal and any alternating stuff like I do here. Okay. Got it. And so this does get a little bit confusing. There's the coupling, AC and DC, and then there's the signal itself, which can be AC or DC signal or have components of both. So let's take a look at how this works. I don't know if we can make this any, we'll try and make this clear. So what type of signal would you say this is that we're measuring? Uh, it's a sinusoidal sine wave. Yeah, so it's an AC signal. Right. Fluctuating, right? right? Yeah. And... Uh, in this case, I'm actually just inputting from this signal generator into the system. I can add an offset to it. So watch this. See that, Scott? Wow. 
Yeah. Now we have You're like signal. levitating the sine wave like a magician. Yeah. We have a signal with both AC and DC content. And how must our data acquisition unit, the SCADIS, must be set up? What type of coupling would you guess? Uh, I would say DC coupling since we're getting both the offset and the alternating portion. Yeah. And so if we look here, you can see what the offset is, 0.67. We are measuring both AC and DC, so it's probably set to DC coupling. I have it teed into two channels. I can go into the channel setup here and uh, switch it uh, so that it's uh, all uh, maybe a different coupling on each channel. You can also change, you know, the alternating part is not related to the DC part. They can, we can control the amplitude independently. But here, let's go in here. We'll look at the channel setup. You can see that those two channels, which had the same signal, were both DC. I'm going to change one of them to AC. And what do I expect to see happen when I measure the signals again? Uh, whichever one you set to voltage AC, I would expect to be alternating around zero, so no offset in the signal. But the alternating portion should remain the same between them. Yes. And uh, that's important to realize, too. It doesn't mean that the offset's not there. Just the coupling on the data acquisition unit is removing that DC offset. And it's exactly like you said, Scott. It's almost like we rehearsed this or something. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a signal with a DC offset and the AC coupled one without. You ever heard of a DC accelerometer? Um, yeah, I have. Yeah, there's one there in the picture on the um, that we can do some measurements. What does a DC accelerometer do versus an AC? Um, it will measure um, sort of static acceleration field. So it would measure like one G sitting at the table there. Well, let's see. Oh yeah. Assuming assuming you're on Earth's surface when we're taking this measurement. Yeah, maybe not on Mars, huh? So or or falling, yeah. Yeah, we're all under one G of acceleration. Uh, AC accelerometers never show you that one G offset, but uh, a DC accelerometer will. And if I flip it over, what what happens? Uh, it would show us negative one G. Well, I thought we would just fly off the Earth, but yeah, we have negative one G because we're measuring inverted. And notice a DC accelerometer. Again, it's not measuring just DC, but it can measure AC and DC. We see those fluctuations plus the, the DC there. Does that kind of make sense there, Scott? Sure does, yeah. And I had DC coupling on, so it's a DC Excel that can measure down to DC, but if I turn the coupling to AC, what happens again? We'll just see all the alternating portions at zero, alternating around zero. Yeah, yeah so we're back, we're at zero. Uh, geez, we got rid of gravity. I, Perfect. Yeah. Sometimes when we're doing vibration measurements, we don't care about gravity. We care about the vibration our product is inducing, right? So we'll use an AC transducer. Sometimes we'll use a, a DC. I got an ICP microphone. Should I use AC or DC coupling with that, Scott? Um, I would say AC coupling because I don't really care about any offset if there were one right uh what if i have an icp accelerometer ac or dc coupling hmm i noticed you called the previous one a, a dc accelerometer this one's an icp accelerometer so i'm assuming ac wait i called it yeah before when you asked me about have i ever heard of a dc accelerometer you said dc so now you're going with ac you're right yeah all right, I see. You used the very advanced logic there. I couldn't quite follow. So this uh, AC coupled. And in fact, any ICP or the generic name IEPE sensor, you don't want to measure the DC on it because it, it actually has the supply voltage. That's how you get away with a single wire. It supplies the voltage, a DC voltage, to the transducer at zero hertz or as an offset. So with ICP transducers, it's always AC coupled. Whether you even set AC coupling mode or not, you can. If you set DC, you'll see a uh, 
offset that maybe you don't want. So AC coupling. All right, next part of the chain is exciting. Uh, we're going into alias protection, whatever that is, like a witness protection program or something. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. These are examples of aliasing. What, what are these pictures, Scott? Uh, these are all uh, examples, uh, what I would call, a, a, I think it's a rolling shutter phenomenon where we're using a camera that's sampling at a certain frequency or refresh rate. And so when you try to take a picture of something like a propeller going by, you end up with this weird phenomenon that it doesn't, it's not an accurate representation of what's really going on, right? This propeller is a lot slower than it is in real life, I guess. Yeah, and it's flinging off there, and they're all curved. Yeah. And uh, so they're, the shape is even different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... We have 30 frames a second, and maybe these things are moving at much higher frequencies, so we don't quite capture the motion correctly. Right. I guess the same thing can happen. We set a sampling rate, a digital sampling rate on our acquisition system, and uh, you can see the white lines here might correspond to where we're going to sample the red sine wave coming in. Yep. If I did that, I got little yellow dots here. Look at that fancy animation. Shows what we would see after we digitize the data. Is my digitized data, the yellow stuff, representative of the actual signal? Did I get the right amplitude? The amplitude looks correct, but the frequency is very wrong. Yeah, just like the frequency of those, uh, in those pictures was wrong because of the frame rate. So, or like you see with the uh, wagon wheels and old westerns that seem to roll backwards because of the speed of the movie cameras. And so if you have aliasing going on, if you start at something like 25 hertz and you go up and you're sampling at a slow rate like 100, you see these frequencies, they actually kind of like repeat themselves. Like uh, the frequency is wrong above half of the sampling rate. So yeah. rate of 100, we can only measure up to like 50 hertz or so correctly. Looks like we got this correct. And then after that, it all went to pot, Scott. Yep. 40 hertz, 25 hertz, when it was really 75 hertz. So how do we stop this aliasing from happening when we're doing measurements? Nyquist frequency, by the way, is half the sampling rate, or FS. We could just sample super fast, right? I would never have aliasing. Well, I mean, there's always going to be, there might be frequency content out there. Even if you sampled at a million hertz, there might be content out there to a million and a half. Yeah, I mean, we don't know, right? But Yeah, as I just sample infinity, right? That shouldn't be a problem capturing an infinite amount of data yeah for start start back in an infinite amount of time in the past and take data for an infinite amount of time into the future yeah no this isn't going to work Fine. and higher you have to sample the larger the file size and the data file sizes etc so rather than try and sample super high to capture it we can use a filter that we apply to the incoming data to make sure that there's no frequency content that we can't sample properly. Does that kind of make sense to you, Scott? Yeah, that sounds yeah. great. It'll conserve a little bit of space. So filters kind of look like uh, this. They have a certain uh, roll off, but you know they allow frequencies to pass you know, without doing anything to them and then eventually get rid of it. Now, if I'm doing um, an anti-aliasing type operation here, Scott, let's say this was my uh, maximum f frequency I want to measure, half my sampling rate. That's typically how they set up these filters to do some attenuation up to 3 dB at this point. If I want to go up to 500 hertz, let's say, I don't even, why don't I just have a filter that goes up to 500, then down to zero, and, uh, like that. Why do I have to have a filter with a gradual roll-off? It's just the way it is, I think. Yeah. It's very hard to make a filter that's got a brick wall. It takes the gross national product of a country or something to, to do that. So they all have some sort of roll-off, no matter what. And that also 
creates some interesting things. That means at a certain point in the frequency range we're measuring, the data is being attenuated. And it's not fully gotten rid of till above that. Let me do an example here so you can explain this. Here we got a sine wave. We're going to sweep through the frequency range. We got uh, at the top, we have no anti-aliasing filter. And then at the bottom, we have the same signal being measured, but with an anti-aliasing filter. We're going to sweep from 300 hertz to 1,100 hertz. And we want to measure up to 800. The anti-aliasing filter is going to kick in around 640 or so. So as we watch here, watch as we approach this, the anti-aliasing data, the data with an anti-aliasing filter, you'll see this signal start to reduce around 640. The one without a filter at the top shouldn't change at all. You watching, Scott? I'm watching. There's... Does it look like it's getting smaller yet? It's a oh, yeah. subtle effect, but as we get closer... Oh, yeah, look at that. And then oh. we have that false frequency identification. We're at 850 here, and we see it at 750. But the amplitude is at least a lot less. And then if we keep sweeping up, it, eventually that anti-aliasing filter should get rid of everything. And it should be actually around 640 hertz in this case, because it was a uh, you know top 20 percent. It it took a while to get rid of the uh, to get rid of the signal, but it did do it eventually. But something to keep in mind: anti-aliasing filter stops you from measuring the frequencies wrong, but it also affects the data by attenuating it, and a portion of the data, like the top 10 or 20 percent of the frequency ranges of could have aliased frequencies in it. That makes sense so far, Scott? Yeah. Okay, so we did a lot of filter things so far in the presentation. I thought I'd talk about some, some of the filters in detail. We got uh, AC coupling that removed the uh, DC bias, right? We had an anti-aliasing filter, right, to get rid of that. We could use filters maybe for noise removal. And then there's other filters used to, to do things, A weighting and whole body vibration. This is what an AC coupling filter looks like at half a hertz. So if I look up from half a hertz here, there's a 3 dB down mark or 0.707 of the amplitude. And this is getting rid of the DC, but it's actually because the filter doesn't go, you know, magically get rid of zero hertz. There's an area where it's attenuating the data like at 0.1 hertz or at so the filter, not a brick wall, you know, whether it's AC coupling filter or whatever. There's another filter example or where a filter could be used. This is an A weighting curve. And here the filter is attenuating data below 1,000 hertz and attenuating data above 4,000 hertz and amplifying a little in between. A weighting filter is used on microphone data where a microphone hears perfectly, our ear doesn't. We have trouble hearing at low frequency and we have trouble hearing at high frequency. So it mimics the effects of the human ear. Same thing for motion sickness or vibration. You can apply filters that mimic the response of the human body to vibration and motion. So, you know, we're very sensitive about 0.125 hertz or so to vibration at low frequency. It'll make us nauseous or sick. Here's some example filters. So we broadly speaking, this is how you could categorize them. There's a low pass filter here and a high pass filter. So it's getting rid of the lows and allowing the high frequencies to go through. The low pass, on the other hand, keeps this, so yay, and gets rid of the high frequency stuff. And then we can let part of the data through depending on the frequency range or stop it or whatever we'd like to do. So again, a filter typically has things like area where we keep some data, where we attenuate it, get rid of it. We can also amplify it, which isn't shown here. Filters can be both done uh, in analog and in digital. So the anti-aliasing filter on the SCADIS is analog, but we also have digital filters. So this is a digital representation where we have a bunch of discrete points and input time history. A filter with some coefficients, you know, five or six coefficients, and then an output time history. You know, a few things about the filters you look at the shape of this thing and this is kind of like the time domain representation of the filter 
the more data points we use to describe it, the narrower transient we can get here. And so we can get a more steeper filter, more like a brick wall. So they typically refer to that as the order of the filter. And if you looked at the orders here of the filter, Scott, what happens as we increase the order? Yeah, that comes closer and closer to being a vertical brick wall, like you were saying. Yeah, and this is in the digital sense. You know, the higher you make that, you can try and make that number infinity, but I don't think the computer will like it. To, <laughs> but uh, the higher you make it, the sharper the filter from a digital point of view. Now, that filter representation we had, where we had the output and the input and the filter itself, interesting thing about that is, you know, your first data point is data point uh, zero. So that's, this would be like a zero. Computer guys like zero, not one as their first data point. And then the filter coefficients are numbered zero through n. Maybe it could be up to five or something. And uh, if we have zero minus five here, what does that mean for the first data point? It's x minus five. Hmm. Do we have data points five spots back? No, we, no matter when we start, we didn't start early enough, right? Yeah. So you can see here that uh, however many coefficients we have in that filter, we need that many data points backwards. And this creates a delay in the filter result because you need a certain amount of time data in order for the filter to start uh, working. It's basically what it amounts to. And both analog and digital filters have that. So if I apply the filter to some data here to reduce this spike, and I can you know, this is some sound data, and this is the vibration that produced that sound. What would you say about this filtered data, Scott? Is it well aligned with my original vibration data? No, it looks like it's unrelated to the event yeah, in blue there. Yeah. So this filter delay creates, uh, I guess, an issue, if you will. Uh, let's just take a look at filter order and delay. Here I got a signal in test lab. What do you think of this signal, Scott? It's kind of furry. Yeah. There might be some sort of sinusoid hidden in there. What kind of filter should I use, maybe? Mm, I'm going to go with a low-pass filter. It yeah, looks like I, the sinusoid is nice and low frequency. Yeah, I want to get rid of the furriness, which is high frequency, and I'll use the a low-pass filter to do that. So that's on channel 7 here. That matches up. And maybe I'll just try um, try the filter. Let's see. Uh, like this, hit calculate. All right, did I do a good job removing furriness? Mm, I wouldn't say a good job. I reduced it a little. Yeah. All right. A little. Let's, we learned some stuff about filters. We know that if we increase the order, well, actually, I'm cutting it off yeah. at 500 hertz. Maybe I should cut it off at five hertz what do you think of yeah that? let's start there that's what i would do yeah and uh i'll hit uh calculate again that didn't change it too much let's uh let's increase the order to make the filter uh sharper does that sound like fun yeah let me see how sharp 200 gets me oh yeah 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 now we're talking. But that should be like a sinusoid or something. Let's... Yeah, not great. Hey, we got a digital filter. We don't have to use the gross national product. Let's uh, let's crank it up. 2,000. That's even sharper, huh? Boom. Pretty good, Sweet. huh? We got yeah. a lot. But what did I do by increasing the order of the filter? Now it's offset in time, that delay. Yeah. So... Uh, there is, uh, in the software here, the option to do this filter mode with zero-phase filtering. I'll hit Calculate. Now it's aligned again. It actually feeds the data back through. This is only something you could do digitally, back through the filter backwards to remove the delay. You do lose a little bit of data at the beginning. You can see it's not quite right, that sine wave. But uh, you end up uh, with, um, um, you know, a better aligned uh, time history. So that's a little bit about delay and orders and things like that. Great. All right.
So let's uh, go back here again. Um, there are two types, major types of digital filters, or IRR and FIR. One's a finite impulse response, one's infinite impulse response. It uses uh, recursively some of the output of the filter to do a, uh, for the same order, it can uh, do a better job attenuating. So it tends to be faster used in real-time applications, an IR filter. FIRs tend to be slower. IRs, though, sometimes aren't stable, whereas FIRs always are. So you'll hear those uh, categories sometimes. All right, so now we got, uh, hopefully, uh, no anti-aliasing or no aliased data due to our filtering, which was analog. And now we're ready to convert it digitally, and we're going to do a few things. First thing we have to think about is the rate at which we digitize, the number of samples per second. We have a 10 hertz sine wave here. At the top, it's sampled 1,000 times a second. You can see the amplitude is 1. If we have this uh, 10 hertz sine wave sampled 30 times a second, there's three data points per cycle there. Did we capture the amplitude fully, Scott? No. No. 0.87. If you want to capture that amplitude accurately in the time domain, you need to sample like 10 or 20 times higher than the highest frequency contained in the signal. Okay. Interesting. Same thing on the y-axis, the amplitude on the y-axis. There's We can break that up into discrete samples. Uh, some analyzers use 2 to the 8th number of bits. That means they can break this up into 255 steps along this axis. Here we're using a lot less than 255. What happens if we use too few steps along the y-axis, Scott, to our green curve, which is the actual signal? Yeah, we'll end up with like the red curve. It'll be blocky. It'll blocky, like, uh, stair-steppy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of modern analyzers use 24 2 to the 24th number of steps, 16 million. Why would they use so many? Uh, just like the more pixels on your computer screen, the, the better a round um, element looks. The Less better blocky. it looks. And also, some of our signals could be, you know, even if we're set up to measure up to 10 volts, if a signal comes in really small, it's not going to use all the bits, right? You got all these bits here millions of them, but if your signal is only hanging out around here, just get a few bits. So uh, small signals benefit from you having a large number of bits to still have enough bits to digitize it, because you're not going to use the 16 million, which is distributed over 10 volts. You might use it over a smaller voltage range. So uh, if for some reason we didn't quantitize it quite night, you get a kind of a bit noise looking thing. This would mean poorly quantized data. Can you see that, Scott? Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, this would be another effect. It could look a little hairy. This low noise, low amplitude signal being digitized has a high noise floor. Typically, what we'll do is we will do a gain. So if you had that really small signal, 0 0.001, and we wanted to see it, you know, we could digitize it well if it was 10 volts. We just multiply it times 10,000. We divide the amplitude by 10,000 to get the right amplitude here. But it would be called gaining the signal to match the resolution best. And we get a great number of bits, very low noise. Make sense? Yeah. What if I said, oh, well, then I'll just really gain it up. I'll go 20,000. I'll double you. Is that a good idea? If the mm. system can only take 10 volts? No. No. Then you get <laughs> clipping or an overload. And that could kind of happen, uh, well, you don't want to have that happen. It creates a lot of uh, harmonic content. So we need to make sure that the sensor and the gain that we're using is proper. We don't want overloads, and we don't want underloads. Got to make sense? Yep. Great. Golden Makes Make sense because we're at the final step of the journey. Wow, already? Yeah, I know. It went fast. Um, so... We spent a lot of time talking about analog considerations here, the noise and the wires and things like that. A little bit about digitizing towards the end, the sampling rate and the quantization on the y-axis. But uh, in the next part of the presentation, 
Uh, we're going to go all digital and talk about some of the ins and outs there of doing digital data processing, taking that time data to the frequency domain, et cetera. Sound like fun? Very fun. All right. I'll see you after the break, Scott. All right. Thanks, Pete.